The Baltic Sea Anomaly. In 2011, a diving team came down to the bottom of the northern part of the Baltic Sea. They went on a treasure hunt. But what they came upon was a pretty weird object. When they took photos and showed them to others, many believed it was a sunken spaceship of another civilization. Other people thought that some natural causes formed the object, but the metals inside the structure definitely couldn't have been formed naturally. Now, some scientists even believe it was something that appeared way back in the Ice Age. Maybe it was even a meteorite that ended up trapped under ice back then. A maelstrom is a whirlpool, some sort of a powerful rotational current that forms when two currents collide and create a circular vortex. Even fearless Vikings were afraid of maelstroms because those were forces so powerful that they could sink large ships. These whirlpools remain dangerous even today. But luckily, not for big modern ships that are large enough to withstand the power of maelstroms. But a cruise ship that gets into a maelstrom usually faces massive waves that can rock even big vessels from side to side pretty intensely. A maelstrom can be so strong, it can turn into some sort of an underwater black hole. Yep, black holes are not only present in the cold expanse of space, you can find them here on our home planet too, swirling in the oceans. They're similar to those in space, since they're compacted so tightly that nothing they trap can escape. Underwater black holes often span up to 93 miles in diameter. And if you got into one of those, you probably wouldn't even know it. These black holes act like vortices, but because of their size, even professionals can hardly see their boundaries. Here's something relaxing. Next time you go to the beach, pay attention, and maybe you'll see an optical phenomenon called the green flash. You can see it shortly after sunset or right before sunrise. It occurs when the sun is almost completely below the horizon, while its rim, the upper one, is still visible. For just a second or two, that upper edge of the sun will appear green. It's because you're looking at the sun through thicker parts of the atmosphere as it's moving down in the sky. As it's dipping below the horizon, light refracts, or bends, in the atmosphere and gets dispersed. Wait for a clear day with no clouds or haze on the horizon to see this phenomenon better. You've been looking forward to a nice swim, only to realize that the water in the ocean is red? Better avoid going in. Florida is known for its red tides. It occurs when the concentration of specific microscopic algae is higher than normal. Thousands of species of algae in marine and fresh waters are mostly harmless to animals and humans. They even help us, since they're an important source of oxygen. But some, like the algae that makes the ocean red, can be extremely dangerous for marine animals, like sea turtles, fish, and seabirds. This kind can grow out of control and produce neurotoxins harmful to humans, especially those who have some respiratory issues. Such people should avoid red tide areas, especially when winds are strong enough to push the algae toward the shore. Volcanoes can spew poisonous gas, ash, and red-hot lava. Those are the most obvious dangers most of us already know about. But submarine volcanoes can be very tricky in their own way. Sometimes, when they're located in shallow waters, they reveal their presence by blasting debris of rock and steam high above the surface. Since submarine volcanoes are surrounded by an unlimited supply of water, they can behave differently from those on land. When they erupt, seawater gets into active submarine vents. Lava can be spreading across a shallow sea floor, or sometimes even flowing into the sea from land volcanoes. When in water, it may cool down so quickly that it shatters into rubble and sand. So, there are large amounts of volcanic debris left there. You know those popular black sand beaches in Hawaii? That's how they formed. Hot lava and powerful eruptions certainly don't sound safe, but submarine volcanoes in deeper waters are equally dangerous, even though they're not necessarily erupting. They produce pockets of bubbles, 
These bubbles reduce the density of the surrounding waters, which can even sink ships. The worst thing is that when you look at the surface of the ocean, you can't understand something's wrong. But at the same time, tiny bubbles are there, causing ships to lose buoyancy and with very little warning. A cross sea is a rare phenomenon, beautiful to observe, but also very dangerous. It's when you see square waves, which are more common in shallow parts of the ocean. That's something you can often see in France or on certain beaches of Tel Aviv, but it can also happen in many coastal areas across the world. A cross sea occurs when two wave patterns travel at oblique angles. They form this checkerboard-like pattern. It mostly happens when two swells meet, or when a swell pushes waves in one direction, while a strong wind pushes them in another. These square waves can be dangerous for swimmers and boaters. The waves produced by strong ocean currents can be pretty unpredictable and tall, sometimes up to almost 10 feet. This phenomenon is sometimes called white walls. These waves can be so powerful that they can turn over even big boats. If you fill a clear glass with some ocean water and take a closer look, you'll see it's full of very small particles. Seawater contains dissolved salts, fats, algae, proteins, detergents, and other bits of artificial and organic matter. If you shake that glass, you'll see tiny bubbles forming on its surface. That's how sea foam forms when waves and winds agitate the ocean. When you see thick sea foam, algal blooms might have caused it. When big blooms of algae fall apart in the sea, large amounts of that matter move in the direction of dry land. Most kinds of sea foam aren't dangerous to humans, but when blooms of algae fall apart, it can have a negative impact on both the environment and people. For example, when sea foam bubbles pop, the toxins they contain get released into the air, and they can irritate your eyes or cause some other health issues. You can see a tidal bore in the areas where a river empties into a sea or an ocean. It's a powerful tide that goes against the current and pushes up the river. A tidal bore falls into a category of something called the surge, which is a sudden change in depth. A tidal bore is a positive surge, which means it pushes up a river, making it much deeper. A negative surge is when the river suddenly becomes very shallow. You won't see tidal bores everywhere. The river must be fairly shallow with a narrow outlet to the sea. The place where the sea and the river meet must be flat and wide. Also, the area between low and high tide must be at least 20 feet across. Of course, there are some exceptions, like the Amazon River, the world's largest one. The mouth of the Amazon is not narrow, but the river experiences tidal bores. That's because its mouth is shallow and has many sandbars and low-lying islands. The tidal bore is so strong there that the river doesn't even have a delta. Its sediment goes directly into the Atlantic Ocean, where fast-moving currents take it away. A tidal bore is often unpredictable and can be extremely rough. In many cases, it changes the color of the river from greenish or blue to brown. It can damage vegetation or even tear trees out of the ground. So, recreation sports like kayaking and river surfing can be hazardous in these areas. Even if you just want to take a look at a tidal bore, be careful. Tidal waves can sweep over lookout points and drag whatever or whoever is there into the churning river. Well, it's time to stretch your legs and take a walk in the park. The sun is shining, and you enjoy the weather and life on the whole. That's when you spot a rapidly growing vertical cloud. Bright white at first, it's approaching alarmingly fast, becoming dense and inky. The sky is darkening, and a gust of wind blows the hat off your head. And then, your hair starts to stand on end. That's your cue to run for your life. You're about to be hit by lightning. At this very moment, positive charges are rising through your body. They're reaching toward the negatively charged part of the storm. If you don't react fast, these charges will meet, and it'll end badly for you. If there's nowhere you can hide, crouch down and try to make yourself smaller than the objects around you. 
Don't lie flat on the ground. It may be wet and thus a great conductor of electricity. There are also other signs that scream danger during a lightning storm. Your palms may begin to sweat. You might hear bizarre crackling, buzzing, or vibrating sounds coming from metal objects nearby. Your skin can start to tingle. There might be a strange metallic taste in your mouth. If you're sure you're not chewing on tinfoil, then look out. Plus, you're likely to smell chlorine. That's ozone. Electrical charges split the molecules of nitrogen and oxygen, which are the main gases forming the atmosphere, into separate atoms. When these atoms come together again, some of them produce molecules made up of three oxygen atoms. That's ozone. You can smell it during a thunderstorm because downdrafts bring it from high altitudes to your nose level. You can figure out how close a thunderstorm is by measuring the time between spotting the lightning and hearing the thunder. Every 5 seconds is 1 mile. The sky over your head is darkening and turning ominously green. Something hits you on the cheek. Ouch! It hurts! You pick up the offending object. It's a massive hailstone. But it's not that cold outside, and it's not raining. You notice how still everything is, how quiet. There's no wind whatsoever. It makes you think about the calm before the storm. And indeed, soon you hear some noise. It's approaching rapidly and turns into a loud roar, as if a freight train is moving towards you. Only, it's not a train. It's a tornado, and you have almost no time to escape. The funnel isn't visible behind a cloud of debris. But you can't mistake this rotating column of air for anything else. If the tornado catches you on the road, get as far from your car as you can. This will prevent the vehicle from being hurtled toward you. Find a ditch, lie down in it, and cover your head. If you're inside, get away from windows and hide underground if possible. Now, you're at the seaside, walking along the shore and enjoying a light breeze. Suddenly, the ground starts shaking under your feet. Must be an earthquake! The next weirdness you notice is the water retreating from the beach at breakneck speed. It leaves behind the exposed ocean floor, reefs, and even fish. That's when you hear a distant roaring sound. It's a tsunami, and you only have a few minutes to save your life. Get to high ground immediately. A giant wave is already speeding toward the shore. It's not the only way a tsunami can creep up on you. It doesn't necessarily come crashing against the shore as a series of huge waves. A tsunami can look like a rapidly rising tide. It usually goes hand-in-hand with severe underwater turbulence. It pulls people under the surface and tosses heavy objects around. You can also notice seawater bubbling, swirling, and creating bizarre patterns. It's another sure sign a tsunami's coming. Your dog's restless. It's scratching the entrance door, roaming around the apartment, and trying to hide in the corner. Usually calm and docile, the pooch is now howling and barking. The weather's also been crazy for the past several days. It's hot one day and chilly 24 hours later. Plus, you've noticed that the stream near your house has livened up, bubbling as it's rushing past. Only when glasses start to clink in your cupboard do you realize what it means. The clatter is produced by foreshocks, tiny earthquakes leading up to the main event. Earthquakes often occur in clusters. If there are several weak quakes, a much bigger one might be on the way. Sometime before the disaster strikes, you might notice bizarre blue lights. Some of them seem to be coming from the ground, others are hovering in the air. These are so-called earthquake lights. Emitted from rocks under great stress, They can be seen days or mere seconds before the ground starts shaking. At the same time, some experts doubt earthquake lights exist. If you think an earthquake is about to happen and there's a catfish in your aquarium, pay attention to its behavior. Scientists have proved this species can react to earth tremors. The fish become restless when seismic activity is high. Some bugs can feel a storm coming. They get ready for the natural disaster by stopping any movement. That's why, if you notice that lots of insects around you look drowsy, search for shelter. As for bees, they can predict heavy rainstorms. They begin to work much harder the day before it starts raining. Square waves occur when two wave patterns crash into each other. This phenomenon looks awesome, but only if you're watching it from the shore. Don't even think of getting in the water to play in such waves. 
In that place, there are cross currents that can easily pull even a skilled swimmer under the surface. And if you see wild choppy waves carrying ocean debris and seaweed, stay out of the water too. It can be a sign of a strong rip current. It can carry you far away from the ocean. If you see smelly green stuff on the surface of a lake or sea, stay away from the water. It can be a hazardous algal bloom. You won't be able to tell whether it's toxic or not at first sight. That's why it's better to steer clear of it altogether. Three or four days before a hurricane arrives, the sea or ocean surface can swell up to 6 feet. Waves hit the shore every 9 seconds. The closer the hurricane, the more rapidly the waves crash against the shore. They also get higher, sometimes up to 16 feet. The sky is littered with light, fluffy clouds. Roughly 36 hours before the hurricane reaches the shore, the atmospheric pressure begins to drop. After that, the wind speeds up. Wispy, hair-like clouds appear in the sky. 18 hours before the hurricane makes it to the shore, the sky opens up and it starts to pour. The rainwater often floods low-lying areas, welling up to 15 feet. When the hurricane is 12 hours away, a powerful gale starts to bring along loose debris. Six hours before the landfall, the wind speed is already 90 miles per hour. It's strong enough to break and even uproot trees, fling around large debris, and flip cars. By the way, let's say you're sailing and there are some sharks circling your boat. Keep an eye on them. If the predators suddenly leave you alone and head for deep water, it might mean a hurricane is drawing closer. Get back to dry land as fast as you can and warn others. If during a period of heavy rains, you hear a roaring sound, it might be a flash flood moving in your direction. If you're near a river at that moment, you might see debris coming down with the flow. The water can be changing its color and becoming cloudier and darker. These signs should set alarm bells ringing in your head. If your gut feeling is right, you have no time to waste. Try to get away from that place as fast as you can. Flash floods are often lethal. If you're out in the wild, pay attention to the water in creeks, streams, and rivers. If it's falling or rising rapidly, it might be a sign a landslide is about to happen. And if you see the water turn muddy, don't wait for more evidence. Get out of the area immediately. When you think of a volcano, what's the first thing that comes to mind? Streams of red, steaming hot lava pouring over the sides? Dark clouds of ash rising high into the sky? Maybe you think of a relaxing hot spring. Ah, that's nice. Well, we all imagine one thing. A cone-shaped mountain looming over the horizon. But it can be as green and lush as any other mountain. At the top, of course, there's a giant hole. Like an opening that goes all the way down. Inside. There's lava and gases being pushed outside. Lava is so hot that if you were standing at the top of the volcano and looked down, your face would feel as red as the color of that liquid rock oozing out. A volcanic eruption never comes without consequences for us. And I'm not just talking about people living nearby. The impacts are usually felt on a global scale, too. Can't fly for a while because of the blanket of ash released in the air. Not to mention, it might be a bit tricky to breathe. Carbon dioxide, sulfur dioxide, and plenty of other toxic gases whose names immediately take you back to your high school chemistry class. Funny enough, most of that cloud rising out of a volcano is just water. Well, vaporized from those scalding temperatures. But before any volcano erupts, it goes through stages like an angsty teen. First, magma. That's lava before it erupts onto the surface and gets its name change. Starts moving underneath the volcano. This causes earthquakes that get worse and more dangerous over time. Then, steam and different gases start spewing out of holes in the planet's crust. Our Earth resembles a tea kettle about to whistle. When the gas emissions and earthquakes get more massive, it usually means the volcano is about to blow its top. But those first stages can take years before an eruption happens. Then, the magma starts building up. With more and more pressure, it's planning to make its great escape. It's hard to notice this happening if you don't have the proper equipment. Good thing scientists do.
and they've got us covered. The volcano becomes more active by the minute. Ash starts coming out and spreading in the air, creating ominous clouds that turn day to night. With the magma building up, an eruption is imminent. Then, boom! The surface gives in under the pressure below. The magma makes its exit. It's now lava spewing out the top and flowing down the sides of the mountain. None of this sounds very appealing. So what if it never happened? What if there were never any volcanoes at all? Would Earth still be the same? Not at all. If volcanoes never existed, there wouldn't be an atmosphere. When our planet was still just a young pup, volcanic gases are what created our protective bubble that allows you and me to breathe right now. They also played a big part in shaping the land and oceans. Four billion years ago, Earth was still forming. It didn't look anything like the pale blue dot we know today. It was red hot, and the water was trapped under the crust. It wasn't until the surface started to cool down and solidify that the water was finally able to escape. Volcanoes acted sort of like a tear in the fabric of our planet. Water vapor would condense in the atmosphere and then fall back down as rain. It rained for so long that the third planet from the sun started turning into the blue ball we're more familiar with. In fact, there's even a theory that all the water on Earth came from volcanoes. And without water, of course, life wouldn't have been able to form. Land formation went through a similar process. You see, our planet was a pretty rough place to be when it was forming. It was a molten surface with fields of lava and constant volcanic eruptions and space rocks always crashing into it because there was no atmosphere to protect it. When it started cooling down, a good solid surface formed, but the hot material underneath was still boiling and bubbling and it continued making its way up. The crust would move and form thick layers with the material that was rising up. Over time, these layers became more permanent Volcanic eruptions were still happening, but the first landmass had finally formed. Okay, we'll take the best part of volcanoes, an atmosphere. So what if they stopped erupting long after we got our protective breathable shield? Still not good. For starters, volcanoes created the most fertile soil. Around Naples, you have the famous Mount Vesuvius. The soil quality there is incredibly rich. And that's thanks to two huge volcanic eruptions, one that happened 35,000 years ago and another 12,000 years ago. Sure, these volcanoes caused a lot of short-term damage, but in the long run, these soils were fertilized by them. Now the region grows all kinds of citrus fruits, olives, grapes, cherries, and of course, their staple, tomatoes. There'd be none of that without rich volcanic soil, and Naples is by far not the only example like this. Bacteria, the first living organisms, lived in hot water. Scientists have discovered fossilized microorganisms older than 4 billion years. They thrived in hydrothermal vents. Those are fissures on the sea floor, and they're usually near volcanically active places. This means that without volcanoes, we wouldn't have land, water, or even the first life forms that, as the theory goes, would eventually evolve into all the creatures we have today. Could life have still developed on Earth without these explosive mountains? Eh, doubtful. Okay, fair enough. We want our atmosphere and life. So let's say volcanoes stopped erupting today, after we already have all these benefits. Well, we're sort of already there, based on this story. At the start, there was only one continent, Pangaea. It was a supercontinent surrounded by one massive continuous superocean. Volcanic activity by this time had finally calmed down, and this meant all that energy would gather below the Earth's crust. Here's a little diagram. First, we have the Earth's inner core. Then there's the outer core. Next up, we have our convection currents. Magma is next in line. After that, the oceanic crust. And at the very top, we have our ocean and our continental crust. The reason Pangaea eventually broke up into the separate continents we have today is because of plate tectonics. It's not like the crust is all one solid piece. It's broken up into big chunks, or plates, that are always moving. 
And it's all still moving today. Yes, the land you're standing on right now is sort of surfing on that layer of convection currents. It's a slow process, so it's not like you can feel it. Pangaea didn't break apart all at once. It took tens of millions of years. When the plates move, they cause earthquakes and volcanic activity. They create mountains, too. It's good for our planet as well, because the Earth gets to sort of renew its old crust. If there was no volcanic activity now, the pressure underneath the Earth's crust would keep building up. It'd get to a boiling point the continents couldn't handle anymore. And eventually, they'd start splitting into more numerous and smaller masses. Volcanoes are still useful to us till this day. For one, they cool our atmosphere. Their eruptions release sulfur gas. It combines with water in our atmosphere and cools it at its lowest level, which is where we live and breathe. There's also an excellent use for their heat. Geothermal power plants harness the energy coming from deep inside the Earth and turn its heat into steam. We then use that steam and turn it into electricity. This is the case for our friends in New Zealand and Iceland, since they live in places with high underground temperatures. Volcanic material can also be made into blocks for building stuff. It can be grounded down to make cement, too. If we want, we can even search volcanoes for precious minerals like gold, copper, and sulfur. And who can forget about hot springs? Tourism to places like Yellowstone and Iceland wouldn't be the same without them. And who doesn't love a nice steamy dip in the ones safe for swimming? Oh yeah. In the end, volcanoes aren't so bad after all. Our beautiful Earth wouldn't be what it is without them.